Welcome, welcome, welcome once again. We're doing Radio Dead Air Tech Q&A here on the show. What we do here is we answer some of your tech questions at home, see if we could potentially, possibly, maybe help things out or at least make things a little, you know, less, less bad. Less bad. Less bad. That's what we can do. Um, I am Nash. I do the show. I have over a decade's experience in on-hand tech workings and such. With me is my producer, Mike Gearman. He has similar sorts of experiences. So let's let's start off here at the top of the hour. Mike, what is a dormant cyber pathogen? Uh, I believe that is uh, it is a three uh, word term for a, 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 a chemical element uh, known as bullshitium. 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 Where does that sit on the periodic table? Um, it's uh, on the opposite of the, the chart from that'll be handium. Mm. Yeah. Uh, between, but unobtainium is between the two. Oh my God. Fuck. Fucking save us from stupid people trying to sound smart. And or scary. And or scary. What what we've what what this comes from is from uh, the San Bernardino uh, Apple iPhone. Yeah, the the Apple iPhone. The, the, the words came out as, as though they were a Samsung iPhone. I don't know why we say Apple iPhone. I know we just do. There, there's only there's only the iPhone. Um, we're talking, of course, about the uh, the Apple iPhone case that's winding its way through the courts right now. The the uh, FBI and uh, the Department of Justice are pushing iPhone to Apple. Uh, to uh, Apple, what the pushing it? They want it unlocked. They want an iPhone unlocked. Exactly. And, and the only reason it's locked, and this should be brought up, the only reason it's locked is because the FBI screwed up. Yep. And changed the iCloud password. Now, yep. before people jump in in, in Shinster, there is, at least in theory a valid reason they thought that was a good idea. And that is the iPhone, if you go into iCloud, can be remotely erased. Right. If, if, I, know, if I know someone's iPhone number or their login um, account and their password, I can remotely erase the iPhone. So the FBI was obviously thinking, oh, he has a terrorist buddy out there who is going to remotely erase his iPhone, even though they destroyed, and they, they, there was video and everything on them, of them destroying their phones when they got finally stopped by the police. You know, they, they basically threw their phones down on the street and shot them or something like that. Yeah. Um, so the FBI was thinking, oh, there must be something on this phone. We got to stop the terrorist buddies from erasing it remotely and screwed everything up. Yeah. So the San Bernardino district attorney's rationale for... Now that he's bringing before the courts, is that there is a dormant, just dormant cyber pathogen lurking on this iPhone, potentially. The only problem with that is. There is no such thing as a cyber pathogen. Well, I, I'm sure he wanted to make computer virus sound scarier or more technical. However... And so he went from computer... I can, I can see co co computer, cyber, because, you know, CSI Cyber is a show that's on TV now. <laughs> um, and I can see going from virus... Virus is of, of a family of things generally pathogens you know viruses bacteria parasites i don't know if parasites count as pathogens or not but so obviously someone with a thesaurus and a microphone was involved yeah but let, let, let's 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 dig a little deeper into this sure. he's not saying there is for certain yes that there might be He's saying there may be. How does he know this? He doesn't. He he's guessing. Doesn't. There now, may be a unicorn. 
on that iPhone. There probably isn't. Sure. And here's the other thing about dormant cyber pathogen. Okay, so let's assume for a second that there is some new and unique computer virus locked in this phone, ready to spring into action. Okay. Right now, the phone is dis basically disconnected. It can, from it's anything. not connected to the it, internet. It can't, it can't spread. It's also encrypted. So it, it's going to have a hard time possibly getting out. So if they decrypt it, then they could actually see that, the, oh, wait, we found that there's a, and it's now in our system. We got a virus in our system from this phone. Yeah. Oh, no. So if there were something on there, the only way it could really get off is if, if they you got unlocked the it. Is if you fucking unlocked it. So basically what you're saying is I have this vial of deadly uranium. If I were to open I I'm not sure it, it could potentially be deadly uranium inside this container. I'm not entirely sure. But I want to open it and find out. And if there isn't, my bad. But if there is. Also, my bad. Yeah. Never, never give people a thesaurus in a microphone. You're always asking for danger. This, this is, I, I really, let, let's be a little more serious here. This is the sensationalism around this case. It, well, it's coming from one direction only. It's coming from the Department of Justice only. Because Apple has laid out in very clear terms, logically without having to resort to deadly cyber pathogens, why the precedent set by unlocking this phone would be a bad one and they do not wish to comply. Meanwhile, we have district attorneys, people who are supposed to represent the public good, pretty much making shit up for the sake of justifying unlocking this iPhone. Now, when I have one side who isn't exaggerating, who's laying out clearly well-reasoned, you know, arguments, and you have the other side who's screaming, Oh no, Lord of God, it's a deadly cyber pathogen. It'll come out of there and, and it's be like the Borg. It'll infect you and you will be, you will be lacutus. Or something. I don't know. I just watch the well, TVs. You know, a lot of the iPhone users are Borg like anyway. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's yeah, that's true. You go into a Starbucks, they just got those dead eyes. I mean it's it's a it's a good thing. It's a good thing that the uh a little more candy that, crush. That the, the various, you know, uh glass type things have been killed. That made people look very Borg like. <laughs> well no, the Google's still working on Google Glass. No, 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 no. Remember, remember, remember your, if your Google was a guy, Google Glass, we killed it. No, it's, but they're still working on it. God bless them. They're still working on it. I don't know if they're ever going to release anything, but they're still working on it. This, well, this, this just kind of really it, it, it speaks to the heart of this entire case. It's government. Sca trying to scare. This is literally scaremongering. There's no other way to describe it. They're, they're trying to scaremonger their way into a legal precedent for getting companies to give government back doors of one form or another. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in one of their more recent filings, I think after that TA spoke, uh, they're saying, oh, we, well, you've given all this stuff to China. And Apple's response was like, but we haven't given China anywhere near the access you have asked for. We've given them stuff that you can get subpoenas for. That you you know you subpoena all the time, and we're like, ah, oh, yeah, sure, we'll give you that. We haven't given them a new OS. Yeah, and it's it, it, uh, well, this this we're still going to be watching the, this case, but. This is not instilling a whole lot of confidence in me in the Department of Justice. Not like I had a whole bunch at the moment anyway. Their arguments could be a lot more <clears throat> solid. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Well, Ars Technica had had a fairly in-depth article uh, of ways they could get into the iPhone. Uh, they didn't rank them from um, least likely to most likely anything like that. But they also, you know, they all have a danger of, you know, destroying the phone. 
Yeah, but th they um, have options that do not involve compelling Apple to do it. Right. Uh, and including, you know, desoldering a chip and putting in a socket so they don't have to desolder, resolder the chip constantly. Uh, and blocking a pin that says, blocking the pin that says rewrite so they could just try as many times as they wanted. So pretty much Ars Technica, which is a media outlet, mm -hmm. all by themselves devised a relatively solid method that doesn't involve forcing Apple to do shit. No, it just involves someone at the FBI punching <sighs> things for a long time, going one, 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 two, two. one, 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 three. Yeah, we don't, don't want to do that. Make it Wi-Fi, make it Bluetooth, make it automatic. We're lazy. Sorry. Well, they, they've got to have an intern. The FBI has to have <laughs> one intern somewhere. Because punching in uh, that number time after time, that, that feels like intern work. Well, let's go from one uh, bag of bullshit to a whole different one. Um, Bitcoin. Oh, we haven't talked about this in a good long while. Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin stores this week. What's up? Bitcoin's having some woes. Um, now, you mean aside from people stealing them and there not being much in the way of traceability so we can get their stuff back? Oh, it, it's it's worse than that. They're having their own little internal uprising. Okay. Um, okay. This is going to take a minute for me to explain to folks, so bear with me. Bitcoin works by having part of the underlying system of Bitcoin is the transaction blockchain. What this is, essentially, it's a digital ledger. It says it keeps track of who spent what, not who they are, but this amount went to this place from here to there. Right. It verifies that transactions take place. It doesn't tie it to a specific person, but it Which does, is why it's so hard often to say this 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 was theft. They stole my bitcoins because they were, well, I don't know that wasn't you. Right. Yeah. You you can't you don't say who it doesn't I put identities on it, but it does verify that a uh, value move from one place to another. Right. And the important reason for this for those not not aware about bitcoin is so you don't go if I if I go to Starbucks and say here's $20, give me some coffees. They have the $20. Right. With Bitcoin, if they didn't have this in place, I could go to Starbucks and say, here's some Bitcoin, give me some coffees, and then go to next door to a uh, sub place and say, here's the same Bitcoins, give me some subs. And they wouldn't know because nothing is synced up. Now, the blockchain is originally moved around in uh, increments of one megabyte. But the size of the blockchain, so many transactions, it's expanded to the point that some retailers were saying they were having up to 10 minute waits to process Bitcoin transactions. Imagine you walked into a place, swiped your credit card and had to wait 10 minutes before they could ring you up before, you know, back in the days when the you know, the, the dialogue. Ash is making modem noises, for I, those of you who aren't aware. Some of them have never heard a modem in their life. It's amazing. Um, it, the the size of the blockchain... Either that or you had a hairball from, from Grady. Yeah. The size of the blockchain has expanded to such a point where one megabyte is taking an excessively long amount of time to be able to move that much data around. They've proposed at least one side of it um, it's hard to pin down. There are the original developers of Bitcoin have have uh, proposed one uh, new protocol for moving the Bitcoin chain up to 20 megabyte segments at a time. And there's the entire or most of the Bitcoin community, the regular old imbeciles who seem to think Bitcoin is a great idea. I'm sorry if you got lumped into that, but this is really kind of stupid at this point, guys. You, you can't deny that. They, they are trying to fork it to a different protocol. Now these two groups are at war with one another. It's not getting resolved. Neither protocol is being universally adopted. So imagine, just if you will, let's go back to the credit card analogy. 
Imagine if the same Visa, MasterCard, American Express, all of these, they use a similar system. Imagine, if you will, the companies decided they all wanted to use different systems for credit card transactions entirely. And no one could agree on one standard. So no credit card transactions were getting were taking place at all. Now, because of this, because there's competing standards in the system, some Bitcoin transactions are taking upwards of 40 minutes to an hour to process. And people who were accepting Bitcoin are going, fuck this noise, and they're dumping it. And they're, they're saying that this is pretty much a lost cause. We're, we're, we're bleh, jumping ship. This is pretty much being called the nightmare scenario for Bitcoin. And, you know, um, this is what happens with when you open source the entire damn thing and then try to go back and say, we're going to do it our way, open source community be damned. This is what happens. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. And then there's, um, in the same vein, uh, another solution being presented for this sort of thing to alleviate this the non-centralized nature of Bitcoin. And in fact, there's no one place that processes all the transactions. The uh, Royal Bank of England, I think it was, hmm. is working on or has just completed the development, initial development phase of their own digital currency. So, you know, you go, oh, I'm doing this in whatever, R R RBE coin. I don't know what they're going to call it, but um, hopefully they come up with a better name than that. However, the, one of the fascinating... It, it's a centralized thing. that They're going, we're processing it, done. Because they've got banks and processing stuff everywhere. One of the fascinating things that has grown out of this, aside from the fact that you have... You know, it, all right, for one thing, the, the protocol battle would have been obvious to anybody. You have this rebellious anti-establishmentarian community dedicated to Bitcoin, and now you're trying to be authoritarian to them. Of course, it's not going to work. But one of the interesting things that has evolved from Bitcoin is financial... What? Dogecoin. No. no. Kanye coin? No. Financial institutions are actually, because it was open source, they can do this. They're not using Bitcoin. They're just using the blockchain. And this is starting to become actually rather common. The blockchain is a rather ingenious way of keeping track of movement of currency on a digital ledger. They're just, instead of open sourcing it, they're doing it through their own internal networks. It means transactions get verified a whole lot faster. They can keep track of them more reliably. And yet, they are still, they, they have dumped the whole Bitcoin part of it, but kept the open source blockchain aspect. So, so they're, they're using it, they're using the open source blockchain thing to move dollars and rubles and right. pesos and francs. And, and keep and track of it accurately. Whatever Canada uses for money. And keep Maple track. leaves, I believe. <laughs> Actually, I think it's just pictures of their new prime minister is what they're using. Oh, uh, yeah. They're just Nate, just pictures of him with his shirt off. That's what they're using now. They, they, um, they should have a shirt off uh, competition between him and Vladimir Putin. That, that would be amazing. Um, but it's it's fascinating that the, it, the, the whole open source thing is getting co-opted by private businesses. And meanwhile, Bitcoin itself is floundering around. They can't even get their shit together on their own protocols on how things work. So I just find that hilarious. Bit don't put your money in Bitcoin. Don't buy a Bitcoin mining rig. No, it's like buy Bitcoin. It's like <laughs> unbuy Bitcoin. It's like the fucking Franklin Mint. Nothing is going to appreciate in value. That fucking Civil War oh, chess God. set isn't worth shit. Yeah. Um, now, finally, this week in the news side of things, something fascinating happened, at least in terms of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, for a long time. 
there have been computers that have been able to outplay people in chess. Chess mm -hmm. has been one of those games that has, technically, there are only a certain number. It's a large number, but there's only a certain number of permutations possible. Yeah, but, but chess is not a solved game. So let me, minor save here. Solved games are games where every possible move could be known. Possible combination of moves and how to respond to them. Tic-tac-toe is a very trivial solved game. Right. Chess is not solved. Um, but while computers were able to beat humans when it comes to chess, a, ve a very, very seemingly simple game, Go, has been one that it's not been possible to do. The, the, just the, the, It always said it just wasn't possible. Now a new hallmark in artificial intelligence has come up. Um, perhaps you're familiar with DeepMind. This is Google's... This is Google's big AI cluster. This is what's going to be what's going to kill us all eventually. In case you didn't know, um, I thought that was Donald Trump. No, 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 no. It's Deep Mind. It's the Skynet. It's it's what all the, the the tech bros think is the most dangerous threat to to humanity is artificial intelligence. Um, you you may have had some fun with Deep Mind and Deep Dreaming, which is that nice little function of Deep Mind that takes your picture and turns it into. Hunter S. Thompson, night, Nightmare Fuel. Puts eyeballs everywhere. Yes. But um, a, Google developed a computer uh, via DeepMind. Their, their software is called AlphaGo. And it has defeated the world champion of, of Go. Uh, in a 3-0 to o shutout. It was a best of five matches. 3-0. to o, Shut him down. Um, I find this personally fascinating because a lot of the scuttlebutt about this has been that AlphaGo was able to come up with ideas and strategies that even human players... We're not, it wasn't really readily accepted among human players. These were viable strategies. Now, AlphaGo was able to do this, not by being programmed to play Go, but it was designed to watch humans. It, it's, it's, they call it a neural network machine. It watches human players. It analyzes their behavior and it keeps this massive storehouse and by by using the same kind of uh, an algorithm that allows it to determine to shuffle through possibilities it then was able to beat the human champion who was uh lise uh lise doll um who is kind of humbled and and sh and just sort of like well, fuck me about the whole situation. Yeah, he was expecting to, uh, you know, I'm reading this, he was expecting to win either 5 0 or 4 1. Yeah. And uh, got hammered 3 0 himself. Yeah, and it's, it, it's fascinating to me. And it's, yeah, people are saying a neural network. So, Skynet. You know, I would have chosen any name other possible to describe that computer than a neural network. Just we have the we have the Terminator stigma. Did you really have to call it a neural network? Anything else? You could have come up with with any other euphemism for how that thing worked, but a neural network. Really? That's that's the name you guys went with. Oh, that was not a good idea. It, but what, what's what's even amazing is that even the artificial intelligence community was not expecting this. This this thing has outlived or outpaced everyone's expectations for its capacity. And it's 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 fantastic in its own way. It, it means new possibilities, not for conscious computers. We're not talking about consciousness here. Artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is what makes the little dude in World of Warcraft 
know how to walk around and smack you in the head. It's 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 all over computers in very small and large ways. What this means is if a computer has more ways of processing information that's a little outside of the box, it may be able to come up with faster solutions, better solutions, simpler solutions than what a human can conceive of just with the information right in front of me. It's, it's another tool for getting things done. And advancements in that are terrific. There is no consciousness involved here. There is no sense of self. AlphaGo is not happy that it won. It, but it did win. Which yeah. is... Very neat. Yes. And I love that. It, it's it's great. We We are making interesting strides in technology, and I love that kind of shit. Now let's talk about when strides in technology go a little no good. They go a little no good. We're, we're, it, we are, of course, talking about it. It's time to get to your questions. If you have questions for Mike and myself um, that we could potentially answer for you here, um, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to take care of those. Uh, let's, I want, let's start with uh, Renee's question because okay. uh, this, this one's come up for me. Um, I'm currently using a Samsung Galaxy Note 3 as my spare tablet, but something has concerned me. My last OS update for the device was back in May 2015 for Android 5.0 Lollipop. Heard horror stories of users on versions of Android below KitKat that have serious issues due to viruses and malware. Should I be worried as there is no update to Marshmallow? Um, well, oh, this is a big, this, this is a big Gordian knot here. Okay. Android works, it, it does a lot of the same things iOS does, but Apple and the iPhone and the iPad, for that matter, have a very different model when it comes to this stuff. If Apple wants to send out a software update, it just does it because only their hardware runs their software. So boom, done. Android is different. Lots and 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 lots of different manufacturers make Android hardware. There is no one size fits all. So, you're starting off from the first starting point that in order to do a software update to an Android device, it has to have its own custom, its own ROM, its own, its own base image for that device's update. That's step one. It gets even more complicated when you bring in cell phone carriers because they demand to put their stamp on any set of software that goes out to those phones, which means bloatware and other bullshit. So you have one, the manufacturer who wants it their way, then the cell phone provider who wants it their way, and the cell phone provider is the gatekeeper on if you get that update. And then there's another complication. Sometimes the manufacturer doesn't want to be bothered to set up a software update for Android, on some older hardware because they'd much rather you just go out and throw down another three to four hundred dollars on a brand new piece of hardware. These, this is the Android fragmentation that we're looking at these days, and it's a pain in the ass. Now, that's not to say that some security updates haven't gone out that are independent of all of the whole the stuff google's been pretty good about this about yeah. making manga if it's if it's truly critical they've been pretty good about forcing things out right so while it may not be the latest and shiniest try to think of it in this way it's like a software a security update for windows 7. microsoft doesn't support windows or doesn't want to support windows 7 anymore they, they want everybody to be on windows 10. But to make sure that, you know, fucking viruses don't make your fucking computer explode when a new one pops up, they'll still put out security fixes for the older software. 
it just over time, less and less of them will come out for Windows 7. It's like why you don't see Windows NT right. security fixes unless you pay Microsoft a really large amount of money. Yeah, and there are some companies and governments who have to do that because they just will not upgrade. Yeah. Um, or in some cases, they can't upgrade. Yeah. So in this case, should you be worried about it? In terms of security, probably not. Marshmallow is fairly up to date and fairly secure, and they are pushing out security patches as needed. You do, you and every other Android user does have another option, but I cannot go into the, the, the length and breadth of it because it would take the entire rest of the show and then some. And that is loading your own custom ROMs, right? Yes. This is an option that is exclusively available for Android folks as iPhone. They you can't do it. They lock If you could, FBI out. wouldn't be suing them. Yeah. Um, Android is open source, which means it is open to the open source community, just like Linux or any other piece of software is that is, that is open source. People come up with their own homebrewed versions of Android for specific devices. Some good, some not so good. Some good, some not good. good. And depending on, uh, I don't remember which, which, Galaxy Note. So it's a Galaxy Note 3. There's probably a version that runs on that. More obscure uh, Android devices might have more difficulty. Yeah. but uh, The Galaxy more mainstream a device, the more likely there is to be a ROM you can load. Yeah, Ga Galaxy Note 3 was 2013, so it is relatively recent. Samsung is notorious for not keeping up with the updates on uh, Android devices and letting some just go, fuck it, buy a new one. Because yeah. they just want your fucking money. Um, in this case, my recommendation would be, and you're gonna, here's, here's, if you really want to update it, you can just understand you're going to need to follow step-by-step -step directions. You're going to have to pay attention, read them, and do it very carefully. Because one of the nasty side effects of flashing your own custom ROM is you run the risk of bricking your device. Mainly because manufacturers don't want you to do this, specifically because they just want you to buy a new one. They don't like the idea of, of their hardware outlasting their time frame on it. They just want you to buy a fucking new one. So they make it difficult to do custom ROMs, but ROM people are very... The, the, the community is built up around it. They are very persistent, and they are very stubborn. And they find ways around you know the ways that are meant to... Stop. Just about everything. Just about everything. So... Um, my recommendation would be Cyanogen Mod. It's a fairly widely used one. It's well known. It has a large community, and there is a version available for the Galaxy Note 3. You'll have, just look up Galaxy Note 3 Cyanogen Mod. Just Google that. You will find tons of detailed instructions. Just be willing and able to follow them. Now, that said, if you don't want to do this, you're probably still relatively safe. Yeah. It, and there are antivirus programs out there for that tablet, free and not free. Yeah. In, in terms of security-wise, you should be fine. I, I it, for, for as long as you're going to keep that tablet, you're probably going to be fine. You can upgrade it. Just understand it's going to take a lot. It's going to take effort on your part. You're going to have to learn some shit. Two things Americans hate to do. So that that would be my best, you know, best recommendation. I, I mentioned Cyanogen Mod because it has a large community and it's fairly well regarded, even though, irony of ironies, it's owned by Microsoft now. Yeah. <laughs> Microsoft got into the Android business. So all right, let's see. Uh, we've got one from EC EGC here. Hello, Nash and Mike. Uh, rather basic question, but important. Computer cases, how I into them? I think there's a verb missing there. That is how you verb. How should one go about appraising for purchase and maybe what brands have cheap but solid offerings? Is a full ultra tower always better than a mid tower or is it more really more about what fits? 
about front panel connectors? Are they super important to know specifics about? Well, let's start with the mid tower, full tower, super tower. It's all about what you have physical space for. Mini. Well, it's not just about physical space, but well, well, yeah, basically. The, the, for me, the, the, the big consideration is what can I physically fit in the space that I can get? You know, I have this much space. What can I fit in there? Mm. Obviously, anything over that, I'm not going to buy. So. Well, th th there is also another consideration there, too, and that is do you overclock? All yeah, right. That's true. Let, let's break it down a little more simply. When we're talking about these computer cases, we're talking about what's considered the standard sizes of a PC case in you know the marketplace today. Most computers you see, most ones that come out of the store, most of the ones you see where you work, are considered a mid-sized tower. That that is the the standard that's that's everywhere. Mid-sized towers are about yay big. Is, well, not they're about. Wait, they, you got to show where you're measuring from, Nash. I know it doesn't it doesn't really work with it. They're generally the, the the kind that just fit next to your desk. They're or fit under a monitor. Yeah, they they they're they're considered the standard these days. Then you have the smaller ones. You have like the, the micro cases. Which Nash and I have explained why these are a bad idea. Yeah. Um. So the mid tower is pretty much the basic. If you're not going to do anything super special, mid tower is your best bet. Yeah, they're in, they're relatively inexpensive um, because there's not as much physical material the company's having to spend on. Right. And you know, extra bracing, wheels, etc. Mid towers generally don't have wheels. No. Um. There's also you talked about front panel connectors. These, what we, we talking about that is when you see a USB panel on the front of a computer or headphone jacks on the front of the computer, those actually have little wires inside that extend and plug into the motherboard in specific places. So if you have a USB port, it's got a USB cable inside, not the kind you're used to. It's, it's little pinout cables. Yes. Uh, and they're, they're basically color coded. If right. it's white, it's probably USB one or two. Yeah. And if it's blue, it's USB, USB three. These are pretty much standardized in terms of how they plug into a motherboard these days. A modern motherboard will have spaces for everything in a modern case. Now, if you're trying to use an older case with a modern motherboard, some things might not plug in so well. If you're trying to use an older motherboard with a modern case, some things might not plug in too well. They tend to keep pace with one another. So if you're buying a new motherboard, buy a new case. That That's generally... That, well, it depends on how old your case is. Right. Point, right. Anything uh, past five years old, you might want to think about, you know... You should at least look to see, you know, if you can find a spec sheet online to go to do the holes match up. Yeah. Um... um the, the other big thing about the front panel connectors is you can buy front panel cards, effectively. Uh, either you know, It's either something that fits in a drive bay that has a lot of cables that run back to various things, or an expansion card that provides pinouts for cables to run to the front. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a mix and match thing. So you can, yeah. but you, it, can, you can actually do both. But in, in, in most cases... You're not going to have to worry about it. The, the instructions for your motherboard will tell you what plugs into where, and the yeah. cables are all fairly standardized. Now, the other thing, to, of course, when to, to take into account uh, when buying the case is figuring out what all you're going to want to put in the case. Mm -hmm. If you say, I have four external hard drives, obviously you're going to want to have something that's four, excuse me, four internal hard drives. You're going to want something that has four internal drive bays at a minimum. Right. Probably more. If you've already got four drive bays filled, you're going, huh, I want at least a little bit of room for expansion. Then you might want to move up to a full-size case. Full-size cases are obviously bigger than mid mid-size. They're generally considered workstation units. And when I say workstation, I mean things for CAD, for design, things for video, video editing. editing. 
things 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 that require a lot of horsepower. That's what and you're, in your gaming cases, this is where you start running into the capability uh, where it's pre-drilled for water cooling. Yeah. Um, things like that. Your 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 mid tower cases generally don't support water cooling out of the box. You have to mod them. You might find one or uh, you might find a few that do, but in general, in my experience, not as many. Full tower full tower cases they come loaded for it, uh, depending on the brand. Yeah. If you go, I'm getting a full tower case that is you know uh, some just generic brand. Maybe not. Cooler Master probably is. Now, when I speak about overclocking, this is another thing to take into consideration. A mid-tower case is designed to allow a certain amount of airflow to pass through. It, it's built with that in mind. Without excessive modification of the case or specialized fans and whatnot, it's designed for a certain amount of airflow. When you overclock, you're increasing the amount of thermal output inside that case and a mid tower case may not be able to keep up with it full tower cases like i've got a uh thermal take i forget which model that is it's i've got a cooler master yeah i've got mine has three 200 millimeter fans built into it they're pretty big and they're also very quiet which i like too it's um and I over I do overclock my processor because I kind of know what I'm doing. So um, I don't because I don't need to. Because yeah. yeah. you don't edit video. I do. It every little bit yeah. counts. Well, I'm thinking even with even with this one, if I were to edit video, I probably wouldn't need to. But um, but and also adding extra video cards that's more thermal. If you're going to be running four four video cards in SLI together, you're going to want a full size case now. And, and when Nash says, by the way, when he says thermal energy, he means heat. Yeah. Uh, this is not Star Trek. We're not saying photonic energy here, but we mean light. <laughs> um, so, now... It, it, but if you're if you're just building a computer, a standard gaming computer, one video card, uh, regular maybe two, maybe two, maybe two, a mid size case should mid tower case should be able to you know handle it for you. What's your what price should you look at? Generally, if you just want something to work, somewhere between fifty and seventy dollars. Yeah, I wouldn't go under that. And going over that is entirely up to you. Understand, you're not going to get much more value past in, in a mid tower case. In yeah. a mid tower case, which full which, tower, you're looking at the hundred to hundred and twenty range, yeah, probably for the best for your most bang for your buck. Yeah. Now keep in mind that that's just the case. Doesn't include anything that you might normally think is coming with the case. It might include a power supply, but you might turn around and immediately replace that power supply yeah. with a completely different and better power supply. Just the kind of a rule of thumb, never use, ne never get a case with a power supply in it because you're never going to use that power supply. The power supply that comes included with most cases is a piece of shit. There are exceptions, but nine times out of ten, it's a piece of shit. You're just going to have to replace it anyway. Um, I As far as uh, brands I recommend, um, let's see. Cooler Master, Thermal Take. Uh, Antec, Antec's 300 is kind of been, the Antec 300 is what it's called. It's kind of been the workhorse of yeah. gaming systems. The thing I would not recommend, and this is a personal preference, I don't know if Nash is going to agree, is odd shaped cases that may look neat that it's, you know, instead of being your standard box, it is an oblong that's at an angle that looks really neat in the store. It's probably more often than that can be a pain in the ass to work with. Yeah, some of them can be. I, I, my case is a little oddly. It looks a little odd, but inside, it's very standard. It's very easy to work with. Nice little function. Make sure you can take the door off the side. That always helps. Because yeah. yeah, that's the other thing. One of the other things to, to look at, uh, because not every computer case does this the same way. Some open from the left side. Some open from the right side, depending on how things are set up internally. Yeah. Um. Make sure when you're when you're buying your case 
that you figured out where you're going to put it in the room and go, oh, I can still get into that without completely pulling everything apart. Yeah. Accessibility is always a big one. Yeah. Um, you hear the cat? I don't hear the cat. Grady? My cat's a phantom now. Um, well, all right, let's go down to Stephanie's question. Um, okay. This is one that a lot of gamers ask, uh, or it's it's kind of stuff. Uh, lately, I've been wanting to play an old computer game called Claw. However, it will no longer install on my machine, presumably because it's so old. Told there's a way to, like, there to get it run, or my SOL in this regard. I've heard of using DOSBox, however, the program is just very confusing to me. So what I'm asking is, is there another way, or am I just going to try to, and, to suck it up and try using it again, or is there another way? I'm using Windows 8. I assume my operating system has something to do with it. Not really. Um, DOS, all right, let, let's, there is a whole realm out there for retro gaming that relies on virtual machines. These are, a virtual machine is a computer inside your computer. It doesn't really exist. It's just a software sandbox that's been placed inside your existing operating system. That acts and like, well, go ahead. Acts like, yeah, acts like its own computer. And importantly, very important, especially with older games, may have its own clock speed. Yeah, that, that's because some games need to go a little bit slower to work. Or a lot on, slower. Or a lot slower. Um, uh, my first experience with this, by the way, was trying to play Centipede in an emulator that didn't have a clock speed adjuster. Start dead. Start dead. Start dead. Um, DOSBox is a very popular one, but DOSBox can be kind of uh, tr problematic in terms of being user friendly. It's essentially you oh, it, it gives you a DOS computer that you can do whatever you want with it, but it takes a little bit of know-how to set it up. It, it's a learning curve. There is a new one that has come out that is completely free. It's from Oracle and Sun Microsystems. It's called VirtualBox. Uh, let me open that up here so everybody can see it. Wait, we're going to say something from Oracle is user-friendly? I w didn't say user-friendly. As okay. it easier to use than DOSBox. Okay, okay. It's called VirtualBox. It is completely free. It is a uh, full-on virtual machine. Um, that is has a graphics user interface as opposed to DOSBox, which is kind of a DOS kind of thing, a command prompt kind of thing. And it's free. There are also other ones like VMware. I think VMware has a freeware version out as well. I think so. Um, now, the, there is a little caveat here. While the virtual machine software in a lot of cases can be gotten for free, the operating system you want to run you're still going to have to provide a valid copy of that yourself. That's the rub. Yeah. If you want, in this case, I looked up Claw, you're going to need a Windows, I believe it's a Windows 95 or 98 machine um, to run that, or Windows 95 or Windows 98 installation. What you essentially have to do is you have to install Windows in the virtual machine on an imaginary computer inside your computer running Windows. It's not now, as hard nice, as it sounds, actually. Now, the nice thing about this, doing this inside a virtual machine, is that should something horrible happen inside that virtual machine, you go, it was working great here, I did some other stuff here, oh, the horrible things have happened, you can just reset to your last image. Yeah. Just And it's, it's almost... Not quite. Almost as quick as flipping a switch. Also, another really fun the fun thing I do with virtual machines. If you ever wanted to play with Linux, but you just were not were kind of scared of the whole making wiping your machine and going Linux, run Linux in a virtual machine. It's a whole lot of fun. It's neat. You get to play around with all kinds of neat shit that Linux can do. Um, so you get an idea of what it's all about. Now, there is another option for uh, legacy games, and that is third-party sites like good old games where they will sell you the yes. game that works under modern operating systems. I've checked. Just look. Claw is not on there. Yeah. That doesn't mean it won't be on there. It's just not there now. 
the popular one, like Fallout, the, the the old Fallout, and some other. Well, Fallout was on good old games. I, I think it's they had a licensing thing, but lots of older games. If they're really popular, they will get maybe a good old games update or a Steam update. Something that they did a Diablo two update, Mike. Blizzard is still updating Diablo 2. They just yeah, I saw that. No, Fallout is still on uh, good old games. Oh, there's, they just did a Fallout a Diablo 2 update to run, I think it was on Windows 10. Who the fuck is still playing Diablo 2? I don't know. But in any event... You, Not me. There is, of course, another very stubborn option. And that is, you go down to Goodwill, and you buy a Windows 98 computer for 20 bucks. And you hook that bad boy up, and I guarantee goddamn to you, it'll run the shit. Christ only knows where it's been, but it'll run it. Oh. And I wouldn't remember. I wouldn't recommend putting it on the internet. No, do not put it on the fucking internet. That's a bad plan. That's another nice thing about virtual machines is you can monitor and control exactly how it talks to the internet and how it don't talk to the internet. And if a virus gets on your virtual machine, most of the time, it's not going to cause you any problems. Yeah, you flip the switch and it goes. Oh, look, the yeah. virus isn't there anymore. Yeah. Goes away. Yeah. So, th th yeah, that that is my best recommendation. Try VMware. They have a free freeware version. VirtualBox is a freeware version. It's got a, a graphics interface as opposed to DOSBox. It's a little more user friendly. DOSBox is for the hardcore folks, and God bless them. I salute them. For their hardcore devotion, uh, Roses uses DOSBox all the time. She, 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 oh, she, she almost have to. Well, yeah, she's shit. She plays. Yeah, she's she's crazy about that kind of stuff. So she she knows what she's doing. But for the most people who just want to get the old fucking thing to work, one of the virtual machines should do the trick. Um, let's see. Do we have time for one more? I think we have time for one more. We got time for. One more. Um. Let's see. Oh, okay. This is, uh, Gelly wrote this one. For years, I've kept my YouTube account without it being connected to a Google Plus account until today when I accidentally clicked something and a Google Plus account was made and I can't get rid of it without deleting my YouTube account. Do you know how I get rid of the Google Plus account while keeping my YouTube account? Not entirely. Uh, now, I've gone through this today since I saw this question and the instructions they say that how to disconnect it from Google don't work. No. You can change what account it's connected to, but you don't seem to be able to delete accounts. Supposedly, Google is going to be migrating away soon, but there's nothing concrete yet. So if you did this, you're just going to have to wait, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sad to say. But this is just one of that those frustrating things about Google Plus. Google Plus is Google's Clippy. I'm saying it right now. This is their Clippy. This is that fucking thing no one wants, no one needs, no one wants to go any fucking where near. And it's been a huge ass headache. And thank God when it goes away, because we all kind of hate Google Plus with a passion. <laughs> Um, I like certain aspects of Google Plus. Certain aspects, yeah. Certain functions yeah. in it. Yeah. Features. Yeah. I got to play uh, Cards Against Humanity Online all the time with it. Nah. Well, in any event, you're probably just going to have to wait to, to, to see. Google has promised they are going to be migrating further and further away from Google Plus, and they're going to offer more options to disengage the YouTube stuff. They just haven't exactly said when. So, it's frustrating. I apologize. All right. I think that's just going about going to just about do it for us tonight. Um, yeah, just about out of time. Yeah. 
Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Mike, for helping out, as always. Oh, sure. uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Again, if you have questions for us, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. Put tech Q&A in the subject line. We'll see if we can help you out with those sort of things. And other, and until then, uh, we'll see you next time. And we'll be back here Monday for RDA. Good night. Good night, everyone.